Dear viewers, thank you for joining us to discuss something that is so timely and important, Armenia Diaspora Unity. Today, I'll be joined by Drs. Kochikian and Gevorkian to discuss about challenges and opportunities in Armenia diaspora relationships. Dr. Aspet Kochikian is a repatriated professor at American University of Armenia Political Science Department. And Dr. Alexander Gevorkian is a Henry George Chair in Economics and Associate Professor of Economics at the Department of Economics and Finance at St. John's University. Dr. Gevorkian is the author of book, Transition Economies, Transformation, Development and Society in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me. I'm hoping for an active and healthy discussions about diaspora Armenia relationships. As Albert Hirschman once noted, development is not so much about allocation of existing resources, but rather about mobilizing resources that are hidden, scattered, or badly utilized. Armenia's main resource is not copper or molybdenum or any other natural resource, but rather it's people that reside within and outside of the borders of Armenia. So for decades, diaspora has been viewed more like an extractive resource. A major contribution that the diaspora could have made has not happened because of a number of reasons. So would you please discuss briefly the challenges we face in terms of Armenian diaspora, financial and non-financial ties, or generally speaking, in terms of Armenian diaspora relationships? What are the challenges? And more importantly, what are the opportunities? What are the areas that could be improved? Alec? Okay, I was hoping you would ask Aspet first, but um, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Eva, for inviting us for hosting this. It's a pleasure to uh, be joining uh, as a co-panelist uh, with you and Aspet, and also on this platform, the Future Armenian, which clearly is very important. Your question is um, is very complex, I should say. Um, I knew the, the idea of our discussion, but I thought uh, we could have a, more of a spontaneous sort of a brainstorm session. So the challenges are uh, simple and monumental at the same time. Um, and maybe in the introduction or sort of the, the starting, the beginning of the event, we should probably, I should, I'll try to keep it short, but the, the simple one is um, the connection, right? Is there a connection? And what type of the connection is there between diaspora and Armenia? But also the other way around, and hopefully that's the question we can come back to towards the uh, sort of uh, as we go on with the discussion, but it's the other side of Armenia and diaspora. So that's a simple question, it seems, because um, if, you, if any one of us talks to our non-Armenian friends, the perception is that, look, we're omnipresent and you know, there's this massive support network out there. Um, at the same time, the monumental part is that um, the, the connection is very nuanced, complex, very individual based, and not often is as sustainable as we would like it to be. Um, and I'm sure, so I, I think Aspet might contribute more even to this, but um, we seem to react better in times of crisis, a topic which has, and, and a point that has been brought up in many other conversations. And we seem to be sort of uh, assuming the status quo of this relationship, this diaspora and Armenia relationship uh, in times of uh, perceived stability. And I tried to choose my words carefully. Um, things seem to be going well and there's no need to put any extra effort into this. And uh, on, again, this could be justifiable view. Okay, so why not? Yeah, you just need to focus on building your life and your families and so on. The rest will take care of itself. But it turns out, as we've learned over, at least over the past 30 years, right? And, and of course, the topic of diaspora and research is, goes deep with its roots into the history and, and in general. But over the past 30 years is, is at least that it's continuous work. Um, and every, it's almost like every little step is a little tiny brick in constructing this um, you know, system or framework of uh, or diaspora engagement infrastructure uh, between the two entities. But I should uh, probably yield to Aspet's um, points now. 
Okay, thanks, Alec. Um, you know, I was um, I was going to say that uh, because Eva asked about the financial and the non-financial component, I think it's within the more in per your purview about to talk about financial components. We can revisit that, and I intentionally uh, and consciously, uh, and so that I don't look uh, uninformed. I'm not going to mention anything which I am uninformed about the financial components or the financial That's aspect fine. of this. Um, you know, as Alec mentioned, it is we're talking about a multi nuanced and uh, multi vector sort of relations, you know, it's almost a cliche, we say this uh, constantly. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I think the first issue that um, maybe in a, in a way of answering your question, uh, I will ask more questions, you know, after all, uh, this is the, you know, the, the teaching method that uh, most professors do. It's also a way to avoid answers, but it's not. I think these are useful questions that we need to think about. First of all, when we talk about the diaspora, who is a diasporan? You know, we have to ask ourselves, who is a diasporan? Um, I'm not gonna go into the details. Uh, you know, there's academic work about what constitutes a diaspora, who's a diasporan and so on and so forth. Suffice it to say that a diasporan is anyone who feels that they're a diasporan, right? Uh, if they've been living outside of Armenia for, you know, for five generations or they just moved out of Armenia. Okay, or the homeland. This is something I think we can talk about later because that's also a figure. There's an image as to what constitutes Armenia or, uh, or homeland. A second issue, I think, when it comes to issue of uh, when it comes to the assessment of diaspora Armenia relations, and Alec put it very in a very good way. I think you know, to a diaspora Armenia, Armenia diaspora. With one caveat, I would say diasporas rather than diaspora. I insist on calling it diasporas because it's not one super arching entity. It has all the uh, layers involved there. So the next question would be: um, um, So who speaks on behalf of diaspora, right? When it comes to a country, you know, whether you like it or not, whether it's legitimate or not, there is a government that speaks on behalf of the state. But who speaks on behalf of the diaspora? In our context, usually in Armenian context, uh, it is always about the major organized institutions, be that uh, affiliated with political parties, the church, various clubs, and so on and so forth, associations, and so on and so forth which renders our exercise here is a, a bit more complicated. Do we look at organized versus, uh, uh, diaspora versus Armenia relations, or we're talking about diaspora in general? What about individuals? By various accounts, uh, you know, the, the amount of, or the percentage of Armenians in the diaspora who are one way or another affiliated with organized institutions, let's call it, is not more than 40%. The number goes up and down. This is a very generous estimate. Uh, um, again, based there is no uh, data on this, but it is an estimate based on my experience having lived in 60 different countries, visited the 60 different countries on, on different research and so on. You can see individuals are, the norm is that individuals are outside of institutions than others. So this is important to understand because when you're assessing, Geba, you mentioned that it hasn't yielded results as we see, but how do you measure results? If uh, you know uh, um, an average Armen visiting a diaspora and Armen visiting Armenia and starting a project, you know which could have a significant impact on a small community versus a big organization that invests millions and or sometimes hundreds of tens of millions, you know uh, how do you assess? How do you give that that assessment? Now, a big assess uh, the, a big challenge has been I think mutual misunderstanding. I think there has always, always been a misunderstanding of on behalf of the diasporans, most diasporans, and I'm overgeneralizing here about what is Armenia and by Armenia, uh, individuals in Armenia, I'm calling it, see, even the language is not, uh, is not trained for this, Armenians who live in Armenia, uh, about what is the diaspora. I've observed this for the last 30 years uh, in my multiple visits uh, in, Ar in, in Armenia, and I've seen that people in Armenia at least have better understanding of what is a diaspora. Not a good understanding, but better than it was. I think this is also because of the fact that you have interactions happening. Armenians in Armenia are more exposed to diasporans than diasporans are to Armenia. And I, we have to be candid, coming to Armenia for two weeks, three weeks, even for four months, and more often than not living in a bubble, more often than not. And again, I don't want to generalize. And unlike Alec, I'm probably not going to choose my words carefully. Uh, but uh, I think uh, that uh, perceptions actually have been changing more in Armenia than in the diaspora. 
And this is a challenge. Uh, and you see all these stereotypes here, all these stereotypes, be that about doing business in Armenia, about, oh, I'm not going to go and live in Armenia, but if I die, I'm going to go and be buried there as if Armenia is a big cemetery, right? You know, it's nothing more than a cemetery for, for that uh, homeland or, you know, patriotic uh, uh, feeling and so on. So I think uh, generational issue is also a factor. I think more and more younger diasporans have a, a real connection rather than an imagined connections with Armenia. And that is developing to become a critical mass. And that's something to be looked at uh, more closely uh, and uh, you know, help break those stereotypes uh, and release the bubbles or live outside of the bubbles. I think in order to achieve or understand or even evaluate what could be done and so on, first of all, we need to understand what is. How are the perceptions? Why do Armenians choose to invest in Armenia versus somewhere else, for instance? Uh, why do you choose to come to Armenia for you know, two months in the summer uh, rather than go to, um, I don't know, uh, Haiti, well, not Haiti, uh, Cuba or the Bahamas or you know, somewhere else, Italy or Greece? You know, maybe there is an emotional component that we need to also uh, address. But um, these are some of my initial thoughts about uh, what have been the challenges so far and what is the direction uh, that we need to be going uh, in. Thank you so much for your insights. Actually, now we're coming more towards the brainstorming part of the discussion, <laughs> Alec. <laughs> and this follow-up question is gonna be more like, uh, more following what Aspet actually mentioned. As you mentioned, we face a number of issues in diaspora Armenian relationships. So let's talk about the very thing that is at the heart of diaspora Armenian relationships and makes any type of cooperation, if you will, between diaspora and Armenia desirable in the first place. That is our Ar Armenian identity. So I do believe that it is Armenian identity that connects us, makes uh, uh, the foreign direct investment of Armenian origin in Armenia possible, that brings philanthropy, brings repatriation to Armenia or any other types of financial or non-financial ties with Armenia possible. In fact, um, a study conducted in early 2000 highlighted that 71% of Armenian-born diaspora investors and 87% for diaspora-born investors mentioned ethnic identity as the motivation to invest in Armenia. So Dr. Kochikian, as a repatriated professor who has written and talked about diaspora Armenian relationships and identity, I'll start with you. One of the problems is that we do not have that focal point as let's say Jews have. For thousands of years, Jews had that focal point, a physical place with the idea of a memory of Jerusalem to go, go back to. Perhaps uh, there was a place that was located, is located in a nowadays Israel. And that's perhaps why when asked uh, what it means to be a Jew, 43% of American Jews answered care for Israel. At the same time, the Armenian people rarely associated the dreams and aspirations with a return to some physical place that would be located in current day Armenia. So maybe that was why when asked what it means to be Armenian, and granted those surveys were done differently. The majority responded that it is the keeping the memory of genocide, speaking the language, cooking Armenian food, and listening to Armenian music. So the question is, how do we start cultivating that identity? Let's start brainstorming, right? Connecting Armenian right. identity to Armenia, to Armenia, so that whenever I say I'm Armenian on a subconscious level, I immediately imply that I am Armenia. What do you think mm -hmm. the challenges and opportunities are relating to cultivating Armenian identity and what could be done? Uh, and what could be the role of, let's say, um, digital platforms, current technologies, some modern trends in cultivating Armenian identity and building that emotional citizenship amongst diasporans of different generations. Mm -hmm. The floor is yours. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's a good point, Eva, that you mentioned about uh, how, how is identity defined? You know, Ernest Renan, a French philosopher, a thinker, uh, in 1882, he gave a, a speech in Sorbonne uh, titled, What is a Nation? And one quote that I use a lot uh, in defining this component is that, when it comes uh, suffering in common, unifies a people more than joy does. 
when national memories and national identity is concerned, griefs are of more value than triumphs for they impose duties, they impose and re require common effort. So from this perspective, I think uh, it is uh, on, um, you know, um, I, I think it's on not unexpected that Armenian identity is based on uh, on the trauma of the genocide, right? And subsequent genocide, uh, subsequent, you know, uh, tragedies, be that the uh, earthquake and so on and so forth. And now you have the war. But again, uh, the genocide is so encompassing that even people in Armenia would, uh, would allocate to that. One thing I would disagree with you is uh, about the, the premise of the question and the comparison with the, with the Jewish experience, right? Um, the reason for this is very simple. Israel was the creation of its diaspora. Armenia is not the creation of its diaspora. If anything, when 19, in 1991, when Armenia became independent, uh, to paraphrase uh, someone that, I, that mentioned this before, it's like it was the best news that ever the Armenian diaspora would have that had no impact whatsoever on its daily life. Okay, so it was a great news, but it didn't change much of their lives. The institutions continued, the struggles continued. And from this perspective, I think there is another layer that uh, makes it impossible to, or makes it difficult, let's not call it impossible, uh, to have an identity, common identity, is when you talk about, when you say Armenia, or when you say homeland, Right. or when you say country in name, right? Um, Israel versus homeland, you know, they are synonymous. But when you say Armenia and you say homeland, they are not synonymous. Even the word Armenia yeah. is not, you know, does means different things. I met people in the United States who would say, oh, in the old country, they've been here for four or five generations, in the old country where we had this. And then I say, where's the old country? I said, Harpe. Okay, you know, but you know, well, you have no freaking connection with it. You know, you might have, it's what you have heard and so on and so forth. But um, you have that element. So Armenia can be the historic land because don't forget uh, identities are formed based on family, right? So if your family comes from Van or comes from, even in Armenia, right? When you talk with people, sometimes they would say, yeah, my, my, uh, my ancestors were from Mush. Like they have that connection to something that is not, it's an imagined connection, granted, but it is a connection. So how do you reconcile or how do you bring the idea of a homeland and Armenia and superimpose and create that. I think you shouldn't. <laughs> I think uh, we shouldn't do that. I think it has to have a natural flow. It has to have a natural sort of connection. And I think, as I said earlier, it's about coming and experiencing the land of Armenia, the country of Armenia that creates that link, that, that, that creates that, in, uh, that real connection, physical connection. It's about the land, it's about, you know, the country, this and that, even the clubs for the young people, right? It's like going out and the pubs and so on and so forth. That's a real connection that they would associate with, uh, uh, with Armenia. And I think that's issue, that issue is a generational one. But um, I'm sorry to, ta uh, to, to, to take the, the uh, sort of uh, take it away from you, but I do want to ask a question about something that has been bothering me to Alec, uh, you know, in a way to pass it on to him as well. But for me, it's also interesting, to what extent can an emotional connection to the land be an incentive for people to invest? Is it something that you know you invest based on your emotions that I wanna invest in the country? I have 10, 15, 20 million dollars I wanna invest. Do you do that based on the best business practices or the returns, or there is a national or na uh, uh, ethnic affinity that uh, does that to you? Okay, uh, let me try to build up to answering this. Uh, thanks for the question. But um, Yeva's point on identity is so profound. Um, it's and and as but you touched on, on on the complexities of it, and it made me, and I looked a little bit dreamy because I was actually thinking about what you were saying and digesting it because it seems to me it's not a simple thing that that sort of goes away somehow magically if we figure out like. In this session, we figure out a recipe, and here it is. Uh, it works for everyone. What you refer to as the diaspora is this sort of dispersion, right? We disperse because it's actually the term diaspora, and that's how we are. And even studying Armenian diaspora, going back in history, uh, kind of even the merchant networks that were sustained, and Sepu Aslanian's wonderful book kind of uh, explains this. Um, it, it, it shows how. People maintain their certain their their identity of certain type, even within the Armenian world of specific origin and such. 
but it gradually becomes either they they assimilate or it gets destroyed or one way or another it just disappears so the challenge then comes on well how do we sustain this if that's the point by the way we have to decide if that's the main idea and um now i'm coming to your question and several countries figured out how to do this and not the obvious example that armenians usually jump to um but uh, for example if you take ireland with whom i'm acquainted through my professional work in many ways <laughs> for, um, but also uh, recently we had a session at the armenian economic association with the networking institute out of ireland um, and uh, reading up about ireland's uh, steps made me think about it because yes there is the uh, an effort to draw more uh, business people and investments into ireland from the rest of the world, global Irish. But there's also something that is very uh, uh, centralized and that's coming out of the government. The government of Ireland supports cultural and educational projects across the world, providing concrete specific funding to organizations that would like to set up um, an Irish day, St. Patrick's day, um, somewhere in the depths of pick your country, not to name anyone, right? So any country. Um, so that sort of helps to sustain this cultural connection and also is not that uh, s uh, simple. You know, Ireland is relatively big and there are also uh, sort of allegiances, affiliations to specific areas and people remember fondly where their families are from and such. But the idea is that you maintain this general idea of what can, adds up into this, what we call identity, right? And it sustains it. What we have in the Armenian world is probably the financial resources that are not so much significant, but we have a network of organizations, right? And that is what I think to me, that's where the, the in, in the diaspora, diaspora organizations. And this is where I think um, sort of uh, not the burden, but the responsibility is to maintain this, but in connection to us, but what you were saying in connection with a country called Armenia. Because if someone goes out there and self-identifies themselves as Armenian, then, well, what do you connect with? What is the anchor for you, right? And that's important. Um, how this translates into um, uh, investment, this is not uh, an overnight process. This is another thing. Economic development is rarely simply about increasing GDP or whatever metrics you would like to think about it. It also involves social development, um, institutional development, of course. Um, simply speaking, it's how you feel as a, a resident of a location X living in that location. Do you feel that yourself accomplished or not? It brings up another problem as well, because we tend to think about development as individual based in economics. So if we talk about I talk to students about this capabilities. You have to feel free to choose to uh, uh, not to, uh, you know, free to choose how to live and access to healthcare and things like this. But this individuality has to translate into something of a common good. Okay, now how to put all this together? I think sustaining this emotional uh, connection, cultural connection, goes a long way to build uh, towards more concrete path for. Um, well, we use the term investment, but really engaging with the country because it's not necessarily just transferring money. It could just be, uh, I mean, there are many examples in Armenia right now, by the way, we should not be complaining, by the way, right? I mean, the whole wine industry or, um, uh, and let's just focus on positive results. Uh, the, the, the wineries, right? Or um, what else? Do IT. I I, IT sector, right? Which, 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 which cross borders that's, that are not as tangible borders, right? That's more out there in, in the open. So I think that's important. Um, now, as far as IT sector, everybody wants to become either South Korea or India, and, or at least in casual conversations. Um, we should remember that in the case of India, it was really sort of, um, yeah, it started yeah. as a, uh, it was a push factor, right? Out of Silicon Valley that uh, people who reached managerial positions realized that they had access and connection with the labor force, which was relatively well suited in terms of education, background, and so on. Somewhere, English language being there, you know, they don't have to have English language problems. English language and so on, right? 
Mm -hmm. Labor force, which is also disciplined in terms of organizational matters, right? So here's the job, here's how we're working. And this is quite important. Maybe it's uncomfortable talking about this, but um, you, you go from any of the Asian countries that are successful or people bring up as examples and you find these um, common features. But in any case, and it's the movement of some of the production uh, or tasks to India that started, uh, uh, that helped the I local IT sector to grow. And then only after that, the government realized that there was a potential. And only after that, the connection between in, uh, the government, uh, the country of India, let's put it this way, the country of India, and what's now known as non-resident Indians has become mm -hmm. more formalized and open up in terms of financial processes through the attempts with the diaspora bonds, but which, right. which worked, but then were transformed into more meaningful, I think, um, uh, can banking connections. In other words, somebody working in the Silicon Valley now can maintain accounts in India, help their family, and so on. The only problem that remains is that there's no supersonic jet that will cut on travel time. Um, which, by the way, this, this uh, separation, physical separation, is very important, right? And so hopefully our Zoom sessions are helping to bring people actually closer to each other. Yeah. Uh, Eva, yeah, uh, may ahead. I just, uh, yeah, I just want to add one thing about identity. You know, one of the other things about uh, being and feeling Armenian is that uh, diasporans or some diasporans probably, uh, and again, I don't, uh, I can't assume to speak on behalf of anyone, uh, and I don't, um, is that, you know, it's about the idea of multiple identities. One of the things that triggered yeah. this is when you said, you know, I'm a repatriated professor and so on. I don't see myself as a repat. You know, I'm, I'm, I happen to be in Armenia, I live there, I work there, and so on, but repatriation is such a heavy word. Uh, it comes with so much, uh, you know, uh, baggage and so on. It's about having multiple identities. I am, um, you know, I remember one of the, my first interactions with students in Armenia uh, when I was teaching there in 2000 was when someone asked me, are you Armenian? And I said, sometimes. And she couldn't figure out what that means. I said, well, I am Armenian. I am Lebanese. I am American. I am, you know, a, a friend. I am this and that. You know, it's not just about ethnic identity. So um, we don't need to have that. Just like as I, as I said earlier, that uh, a diasporan is whoever who thinks that she or he is a diasporan. The same thing with Armenian. Why do we need to have a matrix in a way that you have to have at least half the parent, like one of the parents being Armenian, or you have to speak some Armenian and so on and so forth. So um, this is one of the, the key challenges. And uh, Alex, the, the reason why I also wanted to, was listening intently to Alex's explanation is that I remember in 1991, there were so many Armenians who came to Armenia and opened up uh, you know, uh, franchises even. I remember there was a, the first Benetton uh, sort of a franchise opened in Yerevan by, uh, uh, by the aspirin Armenian. But then, of course, it was more emotionally driven rather than investment driven, and they closed it down, you know, a year later or so. But, you know, there is that, there is that component, you know, you feel comfortable. It goes back to the stereotypes, right? This is, I heard it uh, oh, so many places, oh, there are thieves there, or there are this, and so on. And I say, have you been? No, but I know someone who's no, yes, I know someone who knows someone who knows someone in like six degrees of separation, you're always going to find something bad. So I think it's, it's a combo uh, of, of that about the, uh, the real uh, uh, sort of connection and the real understanding of what is Armenia, what is the investment mood, what is the society like? Armenia is not just Yerevan, right? We talk about all of this, you know, what about Gyumri? You know, what about, uh, you know, Vanatsot? What about other places, right? Uh, but, but people, especially from a diaspora perspective, it's Yerevan and, you know, it's set, at least in most cases, but uh, I guess, uh, yeah. I'll yeah, share. but yeah. I agree. And then it's hard to not to step in. I'm sorry, Ella. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. That, that's why it is discussion. I said okay. that uh, we are kind of going to brainstorm. We have some questions that we might cover or might not yeah. cover. I mean, a couple of things that, number one, with this whole repat, sure, I understand the need for the use of the term, but really it's true, real, for anyone who's moving to Armenia permanently uh, for a long term, it's immigration with all its cultural shocks and all of things to be expected. What surprises me about sort of through anecdotal conversations, but now we have surveys uh, out there that also kind of point to this fact, is that how much is expected 
by a diaspora from Armenia before they make a move or before they invest. So they ask for guarantees that their investment will grow. Uh, I don't know if there's a country where this guarantee can be promised. Um, uh, why? Uh, if, if you are running a business, you are taking a risk by definition. It's just, you know, the, the tones of the risk, could, <laughs> as they say, the shades of the risk are different, but that's the whole point. The higher the risk, the greater is the reward. Now, what is the reward for you? If you're yeah. trying to open a business in Armenia, it's probably monetary reward, but also probably uh, some type of uh, self-fulfillment. In fact, several years ago at, at the Diaspora Forum, um, the, the, in the business session, and I was just attending as someone who was listening and learning from things, but quite successful business people from the diaspora, from across the world, pretty much stated that bluntly, they said, listen, we made all the money in the world. Don't sell us a project about making the money. We want to have a project that will have a meaningful impact on development, right? Yeah. Uh, that's so, a great point, actually. Yeah. Uh, that kind of resonates with initially what I said about 71% of Armenian-born diaspora investors and 87% of diaspora-born investors. And it is an important number, 87% of diaspora-born investors mention ethnic identity as motivation to invest in Armenia. Mm -hmm. It's a quite a big number. And if you think about this, um, diaspora-born investors, they have all the possibilities, right, in the world. Like if I'm opening the manufacturing, I could go to Vietnam. Let's say China is more mm -hmm. expensive to produce. I go to right. Vietnam to invest. The only thing that would motivate really me to choose Armenia versus Georgia, even in a region versus Georgia, Azerbaijan, or any other country is because I have Armenian heritage. I have that Armenian mm -hmm. um, uh, identity, as you mentioned, like many of identity, like kind of in my One salad of bowl, of, yeah. In my salad bowl of identities, I have that uh, Armenian ingredient, whatever that is kind of somewhat dominating, not too recessive for me to choose to go to uh, to, uh, to to invest in Armenia, right? And Alec, I'm sorry, also... I kind of <laughs> interrupted you. Go <laughs> <No>. ahead. <laughs> uh, um, go ahead, Alec. You you wanted to say? Oh something? no, I'm fine. I'm okay yeah. with listening. Uh, yeah, well, uh, it's always about learning, right? Uh, but also what you mentioned, Alec, about uh, the issue of expectations, right? As an investor, what do you expect? But it's also about people who move to Armenia, immigrate to Armenia, let's say. They also have expectations. And sometimes it's not real. I have to, again, uh, I'm generalizing here, but more often than not, I have seen this. And I have been living in Armenia back and forth. Um, I haven't lost touch and so on, even if I've just moved there permanently, immigrated there permanently. Uh, so, uh, but it's, there's always that, uh, uh, how should I put it? Uh, the snob, snobbiness, basically, even a neo-colonial attitude. You see people, you know, uh, diasporans coming in and, you know, sitting at a cafe or complaining about service. And you ask for, you know, for uh, freaking sake, do you have the same kind of service, the service that you expect in Armenia? Do you have that service in the country that you're coming in from? I was say, why we're on you the air. <laughs> yeah, that's why I had to, you know, they, I can't, we can't bleep this out, but I, I was careful. See, F, uh, F, I, I agree, F, C, I agree, I agree. But, but see, that's the expectation, right? Or if I have children, I want to move. What are the schools like? Is there anything uh, that, you know, I can uh, sh uh, expect that my, my kids are going to get the education that will bring them eventually to a college in the United States, right? So all but, of these, it's about uh, managing expectations. But you know what's really su not surprising? I don't really know how to characterize it, but it is a fact that the conversation that we're having is very similar to conversations people that were having 10 years ago, and I remember 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, people complaining about long uh, lines and uh, waiting uh, lines at the post office or somewhere else and people jumping lines. Well, come to the city where I am. I'll show you how that's done mm -hmm. by non-Armenians. And I mean, that's not really the issue to be discussing. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think the problem though with the, or, or rather what, what these isolated examples uncover is that Living in the diaspora, people have this idealized view of Armenia, right? Mm -hmm. They expect Armenia to welcome them, um, to be this perfect sort of, of a type of, of something, perfect diamond or whatever you want to compare it with. 
um, that is flawless and it is just good, you know, in some cases to visit or if you're thinking about moving permanently, you don't expect to encounter any problems. But unfortunately, the thing is, it's a living society with all its faults and, 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 and good sides. Um, it's getting that probably is, it, is and, and for the diaspora accepting that reality is one of the challenges because subconsciously there's always something else to compare a stable lifestyle somewhere else. And we, we're generalizing by the way, of course, not every diaspora and Armenian lives in a comfortable lifestyle, um, but generally speaking. So this macro environment also matters now in economic terms, sort of the macro uh, environment in which um, one finds himself or herself uh, is important as well. And whether you feel whether you know, it's all up to you and you left by yourself with your problems or there's some type of a support mechanism. In this case, by the way, all these uh, groups on Facebook are very helpful, I think for repatriates because people just, Pose the question and there's the feeling of a community. But it brings up the next problem. I'm sorry, there's no way to stop here. The next problem is that this community becomes isolated um, mm -hmm. as a group. And uh, where's the real connection with people? As you mentioned, it's not just Yerevan, right? It's but beyond, especially in, in, the, in the villages. And, and when I travel, people ask me, pointing at someone riding a bicycle on, on the roads between Sisyan and Goris and asking, what's wrong with this guy? Why is he riding a bicycle? Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, but things have also been also the, uh, also changing in the sense that, you know, it's real, it's like, it's not giving, you know, there's, there is this whole thing, it's not about investment, it's about smart investment, or it's not about just giving, it's about smart giving. And there are examples, as you mentioned, and uh, we can talk about the bad things, but we need to also realize that there have been Thank cases <laughs> where individuals have actually made an impact or projects have made an impact right either through international Absolutely. ngos yes. um you know the wine industry that you mentioned uh alec you know there's the hospitality business you know uh carpet. that has changed right the, the carpets uh, to the carpet and, and you know we don't have really, a yeah, to exactly but also the other thing is not not by choice you know in the recent years you know uh syrian refugees uh, Syrian Armenian refugees coming to Armenia. You know, it's amazing how the hospitality business, the service industry, and the food industry in Armenia, yes, in Yerevan, yes. the landscape changed dramatically. You know, because you have suddenly 10, 12,000 people, you know, they're working, they have, they bring in the Middle Eastern or the, the, or the Mediterranean culture of food, but also the service and, and so on and so forth. And people are learning from them. So they do realize that being nice to a customer, you know, you will get, instead of not, not getting any tip, it's getting, you know, I don't know, a 2000 dirham tip. So people do, that have a, that has a, all these impact, uh, you know, the rolling impact and the, Identity, the, the issue of going back to the issue of identity and, you know, thinking about Armenia in a real way. I've always wondered about this, that Armenia's independence was the perfect opportunity for the diaspora to re-examine itself. It's, there is no fear of assimilation. There is the fear of assimilation, yes, but now you have an independent Armenia that you can connect to and negotiate your identity and you can think about how to get things done differently and so on. But our, the diaspora never did that. And I think, that has been the major challenge overall. And diaspora has maintained a similarity or an overlap between what is real and what is ritualistic. The diaspora they did not make that distinction or hasn't made that distinction at a large scale. Again, generalization, but this is one of the uh, key aspects. And because of that, the diaspora hasn't been renewing. Diaspora, the meaning of diaspora and the engagement of diaspora hasn't been changing in the space, in the in the in the pace that it needs to. I think that this lack of distinction between what is real, Armenia with its old problems and advantages, and what is imagined ritualistic, oh Armenia with Mount Ararat and the Sosyat's uh, trees and this and that and like, okay, we get it, you know, but you have a real Armenia that you can connect to, you can have a uh, have a emotional and physical connection with. And exactly, yep. and th and this could go both ways. Uh, if I'm just make very quickly, yeah, this could go both ways. One is you actually connect, and the other is you actually turn away. But this is why the work of, let's say, uh, so from what I know, let's say Repat Armenia, Birthright Armenia, uh, is and others who are sort of bringing people for short term. Here is the sort of this cultural immersion or long term is so much important. 
because that what really allows one to test drive whether or not this is for you. And then it may not immediate, there may not be immediate result. The, the, the individual might go back and eventually then return. So, and this is the job of the state, right? To create those environment, to create those, uh, not environment. And I, I'm very much against to, you know, treat the uh, immigrant, yeah. uh, 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 for the I, lack of any other word, the repat Armenians, treat them differently, but create an environment where, you know, I would like to go back. I would, and this also goes back to the lack of understanding. Even in Armenia, we still have at an institutional level, there is no understanding as to what is a diaspora and what would a diaspora think about? They have made some cases here and there, like make it easy for someone who's repatriating for the first time to bring in their household stuff. And so these are small things, but there are so many other things that one has to, uh, one has to consider without without creating a distinction between uh, the diasporans being treated differently than the citizen of Armenia or the mm, of, or high estancy, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. sort of the local high estancy. The, the code phrase I use is engagement infrastructure. In other yeah. words, what's mm. been put in place? What programs? Mm. Um, and those could be very simple ones. Again, the cultural, what Ireland is doing is, is great. Or um, uh, the academic programs, for example, Greece has a Fulbright program um, to bring uh, individuals, uh, young scholars, back and forth. Um, or well, AGBU really established American University of Armenia. So yes, but we uh, about... it was established by diasporans. They bring yeah. people in, but also that engagement from diaspora end is not as active. But as this it is used to be. This um, is the thing. Yes, yeah, but you're absolutely correct. There are all these things in place and nobody's denying them. They're massive successes. They've taken massive effort and sacrifices. The question is in continuing it, sustaining that, right? Mm -hmm. and that's so, okay, so that, that, that I really wanted to go towards opportunity perspective, mm -hmm. right? Like, because we know a lot of examples that where identity really brings uh, tangible results. Whether we talk about Chinese diaspora, 80% of investors in China are actually of Chinese origin because they know language, they know how to do it, you know, things, etc. So that identity uh, in a way can bring tangible or intangible results, just like you both mentioned. And we, in our Armenian case, we see a lot of philanthropy coming to Armenia, which is because of identity. Why would you donate your money to Armenia if you are not are like kind of like if it is not about your identity, if you don't want to Armenia to prosper or like the telephones we see like during the wars or the natural disasters or even in 2008 crisis, we see a spike of donations from on the telethon um, organized by Armenia Fund because people want their compatriots or people who to, who you are emotionally linked to, to do better, right? Remittances are another kind of um, example of Armenian identity and foreign direct investments. And given the current situation in Armenia, we all want to kind of see that the participation of diaspora uh, is more engaged, uh, diaspora is more engaged, diaspora participates more in Armenian development processes, just because without diaspora, at least I see it this way, that Armenia is not gonna be able to prosper without diaspora's help, right? Because if you're a foreign investor of not Armenian origin, you have a lot of options where to invest, correct? And like first mover for, for the most part, whether we're talking about China, we're talking about Ireland, we're talking about Scotland, we, we know the global Scot, that they, they try to attract their diaspora investors. We talk about Israel, we talk about even like African countries. It's all diaspora that is first mover, investor, and then it brings other diaspora network, their friends or others start being interested in the country and investing. So Asbet mentioned something that uh, kind of set up um, good ground for my next question. <laughs> so, there are potentially many untapped financial and human resources in diaspora, but potential is not always actual or available, right? Yes, the diaspora is invaluable and fundamental resource for the economic, social, and political development of Armenia. At the same time, there is a considerable gap between that, as I mentioned, massive humanitarian contribution 
of the diaspora, and it's much more this participation in Armenian economic life, whether we're talking about foreign direct investments, whether we're talking about repatriation, which Armenia really needs the skill set, that new way of thinking and new kind of that fresh air, right? Like the boost in a thinking way, knowledge, the skills that can transfer and do things differently. To make the potential actual, as Beth mentioned, the Armenian state needs to take uh, lead, you know, to have to show the leadership. Maybe the, I, I believe that both homeland and diaspora actually need to show leadership. So my question is, how do we motivate diaspora to be engaged in the development processes of Armenia? How do we show to the diaspora that is going through a serious crisis itself? and need, uh, that it needs prosperous Armenia every bit as much as, uh, and needs, it, you know, needs to become more active in the processes of development. So Asbet mentioned something about assimilation. So I'm gonna ask this question, should Armenia approach the question of motivating diaspora from a identity perspective, from a na uh, national pride perspective? Should it approach it from the classic diaspora sphere of assimilation perspective? From, from a security provision perspective, such that, hey, diaspora, just like you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. Syrian refugees, um, whenever there is something man-made or natural, natural disaster in a country where you reside, you can always view Armenia as a place to escape to, or maybe Armenia should seek or adapt a completely different approach. What do you think? How do we reach this shared understanding that both mm -hmm. for both part uh, that both parties need each other, and the prosperity of Armenia and prosperity of diaspora are quite linked. Yeah, um, you know when you say should we do this, do that, so on, and my answer is yes. You know this we're talking about a big entity. We're talking about state and government. They can work on several projects. So as organization, it's not that we have one individual who has to think about ten different things. So that's one. I think. Um, as uh, Alec mentioned, it's about the engagement infrastructure, which is the job of the, the state to, to create. But, but uh, lest we forget that Armenia 20 years ago or 10 years ago is not the Armenia of today. And I'm not talking about the war, but overall the, the, uh, the human uh, resource that Armenia itself has. Being in education, in higher ed, for instance, I have observed in the last 25 years about how Armenia's higher education uh, in terms of producing um, researchers, teachers, and so on, has uh, exponentially increased and, and developed, right? Yet we still have some aspects of, of people saying, oh, they don't know how to do things, again, from the diaspora perspective. But if anything, I think this uh, the 2020 war uh, motivated, and I've been seeing this more and more, is the engage is the collaboration. So it's not about engagement anymore. It's about collaboration. Be that academics working with other academics and uh, the aspirant academics working with our academics in Armenia. Be that professionals doing the same thing. And this is actually the norm. That's the that's the that should be the norm rather than oh, I am a professor of so and so. I'm going to come and teach you what to do. But no, there are people already in Armenia that are able to do that. They need, they might not have access to the resources or that you as a, a diasporan scholar might have or a professional might have, but that doesn't mean that they are not well prepared. So I think focusing on uh, um, sort of sec the sectoral sort of uh, uh, interaction, like health system. I know people, uh, Armenian Medical Association, you know, they, they come in, they organize, and it's not about just sending medicine. They come into Armenia. They work with uh, uh, with the Yerevan State uh, University for Medicine, Medical University to uh, give lectures and so on. Some there are those who come in and and do surgeries and teach the people or interact with people and learn from them as well. So I think it's about when it comes to the real engagement, as we kept uh, kept saying. I think to a large extent the approach should also be collaborative work collaboration and you know uh, a lot of research uh, social sciences right no one a lot of a lot of people don't care about social sciences but you know i i need to do a research about something uh, an event or a phenomenon in armenia as much as i'm trained as much as i can speak the language when i go there if i have a a, a partner a co a researcher who is actually knows the landscape the social nuances better than me can you imagine how much more uh, how much better my research would be and there this is happening 
it's just a matter of increasing this, or this is a, it's a, just a matter of uh, increasing the, the intensity and the frequency of these things. And that's, I think, uh, what, uh, what should be uh, approached, what should be done in general. That's exactly my question. How do we do that? It, it, uh, from the center, yeah, go it, ahead. All comes from, it all comes from the country, right? It has to be, this is what, if we, if we are to copy anyone's example, the, their only consistent example is that from Ireland to India to China to Moldova, whichever one, there's a central agency that does this work. And it connects in a non-political way, by the way, but in more of informational. Here is a country, if you like it, visit, here's what you can learn, and these are the opportunities you can connect with. Um, so that's what has to be developed. And um, to, to some extent, again, Armenia has you know, achieved great strides because the achievements that we have are really individually driven achievements that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so what you are saying pre pretty much that, hey, let's have an uh, like networks, institutions set up that could be state plus NGOs or state plus private yeah. that would help us to, 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 that would create this ground, this um, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, whether mm -hmm. it's a digital platform or in whatever form it is, that kind of with collaboration of these NGOs from diaspora, from Armenia and state, we can build these networks of, well, let's say starting mm -hmm. a business, business entity or what networks of professionals to connect mm -hmm. to Armenia and give this opportunity, this platform, for people to connect. Is that, do I understand oh, it correct? That's what you're yeah. saying? Something like that, yeah. yeah. Ethnic Armenian living in Greenland, discovering that he or she is ethnic Armenian <laughs> and uh, just wants to say, what can I do? They go on the, on, on, on the web and say, what can I do as an Armenian? And it should bring them to this, what I call digital portal and then mm -hmm. help them figure out, well, here are the opportunities. And by the way, I want to connect with the question we have in the chat. I don't know if you noticed this, but there's one question about uh, Armenia's membership in the Eurasian Economic Union and whether or not that can serve as a gateway to non-member countries in a similar way as Ireland did for European Union. And I think that is that is something to consider um, from purely economic perspective. And um, this is the question, of course, it comes with all sorts of other limitations, but for a large, group of diaspora investors or business people, this could be an opportunity to explore. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, it's uh, and the, the synergy, right? It doesn't have to be organized. I mean, the state has to create those infrastructures, but the mechanisms as well. But again, we're living in a world that you we do not need to have those. It's so easy to set up, uh, you know, that those connections. And you know, as I said, academically speaking, in different disciplines like economics, political science, sociology, anthropology, and so on, it's so easy to uh, to make connections with uh, scholars or people in your field, and you know, work collaboratively. And just for for the sake of example, one of the discussions I had a couple of years ago with a diasporan about wanting to set up a center, a research center in the diaspora about researching Armenia, I said, "Listen, you're going to be spending a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Probably the salary of the researchers there is going to be not less than." $50,000 a year, but you know, you can have the same center in Armenia with a supervisor or with collaboration with a fraction of that cost. You know, it's exploitation probably because Armenia of 1990, 19 or, or even 2000 or even 2010 is not the Armenia of 2021, right? We do have those people. I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed with the knowledge of, of colleagues that I knew, former students that I had in Armenia back in 2000, be that at Yerevan State University, at Brusov, in Gyumri, in, at AUA even. You know, they have the potential. It's not just about the responsibility of the diaspora to, to come and teach, come and help, and so on. It's also from the, for the diaspora to benefit from it. So it's also another marketing thing, right? It's not just about you come and help and the emotional component, but what are also what you can get. Probably rephrasing Kennedy's, uh, Kennedy's uh, JFK's uh, thing, uh, you know, quote, it's like, you know, uh, you have to ask what your country can do for you as well as a diaspora. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, but this is where there's a bit of a challenge because, right. um, and um, it actually, that challenge, uh, which has economic uh, roots, right, and, and foundation, actually made this whole conversation about diaspora mainstream. 
if we um, read Patrick Tololeans, at least his 1996 paper, uh, where he talks about how the origin of the diaspora and how it got inserted into public discourse and so on, um, he, he sort of becomes to a surprising conclusion that sort of, how did this even happen? Why did this happen? Because it used to be just a narrow uh, topic, but it turned out that this connection between diaspora and the country um, of origin or homeland or however we want to describe it, um, goes both ways, right? One is the economic development point and that's welcomed, right? So as long as the money is coming in, things are, are fine. But the moment diaspora tries to acquire a certain individual standing and decision-making, that becomes a bit of a problem. So well-researched cases are uh, cases of Mexico where Mm -hmm. um, labor migrants are able to pull together because they come from the same village and they're able to pull funds together and have a significant leverage over local authorities and so on. Um, so that subconsciously could be a factor out there or sort of implied factor uh, in, in decision-making process. But uh, again, perhaps the, I'm sure there is a way to work things out. Um, and then have a diaspora. That's why we are here, Alec. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry? <laughs> That's why we are here, to kind yeah. of discuss so and brainstorm possible. what could Perhaps, be improved. Yeah, with the balanced sort of participation uh, uh, from mm -hmm. the country and, and from the diaspora. And diaspora. And yes, in fact, I'm sorry, Aspect, you mentioned something that, Aspect actually mentioned something that is very important, like the network, right? Like the connection. And many Armenians, based on, even if I, for instance, I've been guilty of this. I haven't been active participation in my own um, community. However, I'm more connected to Armenia through these digital mm. platforms and contribute more to Armenia. So today, in nowadays, like in today's world, you do not need to have these heavy duty institutions, you know, like traditional ones that you go to your community, right. your community tells you how to contribute to Armenia and you do your philanthropy or you do your business you know, initiatives in Armenia. Now the digital platforms, which I'm hoping that we will kind of uh, later on talk about and start talking about what platforms do we need, really like helps to kind of overcome these issues, helps to kind of like this um, cut through connections, right? And directly connect to the country, to people, mm -hmm. have a people to people connection and get things done. So that is an excellent point. We need this uh, now, nowadays. It, it would be really stupid not to take advantage of those platforms in, think, in today's economy, in today's world. Right. Yeah, but I think that's the critical point here because now uh, it's so much easier, to, uh, so much easier than, than before to set up a fundraiser. Let's start with that. Right. right on Facebook, uh, and then you have someone is really connecting with whatever, building a school, repairing roads or whatever it might be, community project. And uh, Armenians, again, are not alone in this. Uh, other countries also have similar uh, uh, sort of uh, initiatives. The only difference is that in other countries, it's somewhat more, um, or not all of them, but in some of the examples, uh, there's a bit more structure towards that. For example, um, again, if we look at the case of Moldova, which is new to the word diaspora, just like they found out about it 10, 15 years ago, uh, that apparently uh, those labor migrants working abroad could actually be connected with each other and we can help them find each other. Mm -hmm. And once we help them find each other, we can actually figure out which villages they're from and talk to the villages, uh, people in the villages and ask them what they need and then tell that to the migrants and put the two together. And then the money goes to this village to build a road to school and so on. There's what we, we're revolving around is one word, trust, right? And if there is trust, then there's going to be this meaningful connection. The problem with trust is that it requires time. In the absence of time and the, with the diversity that we have, there needs to be transparency. And, and this is where the digital platforms, and I'm not a programmer whatsoever, but I'm guessing if there is a way to to transfer money and trust that we can trust, then there's probably a way to help people connect. Um, and one thing, um, one yeah, thing I, I want to just quickly add, because we're running yeah. out of time. I have one yes. sentence that is this diversity 
we should not fear this diversity, but should actually welcome it because eventually- I was going to just add a quote, a perfect quote of that, being the nerd, Star Trek, the Trekkie I am, you know, Vulcan philosophy. In Vulcan philosophy, there is a, a basic uh, component that infinite combinations and in infinite, uh, in, uh, infinite diversity in infinite combinations. And we should not be obsessed about creating a common identity. What is an Armenian? This, this, this. We have to celebrate that diversity because with that diversity, we can create so many different options. We can, we can create so many different opportunities. So diversity uh, and diasporan diversity within Armenia, they have diversity, diaspora within diasporan's diversity. I think these are elements that we can build upon as well. We can utilize it as well. There is only one comment to this, I agree. But um, you're in Yerevan, how many different events take place during the day? Around the same theme, mm -hmm. dozens, right? That's <laughs> my impression. But what else is happening is that not necessarily there's a conversation between uh, the groups mm -hmm. that are organizing this. So diversity is fine, but as long as there's some link that sort of right. the, atoms be, the atoms in your background aspect need to be yeah. connected. Okay. So we're running out of time. <laughs> yep. So thank you so much for an interesting discussion today. This thank was you. the thank you, first Yeva. in the series of discussions, and I believe we touched some interesting and important topics regarding Armenia diaspora relationships. So for decades, Armenian diaspora has shown its empathy and engagement largely through philanthropy and remittances. I do believe that we've reached the limits of the current forms of homeland diaspora cooperation, where Armenia perceived diaspora largely um, as a, um, a sort of extractive resource, while diaspora views Armenia, as you mentioned, as a destination for summer tourism, maybe some investments and some small projects, but largely staying away from countries' development processes. So as Alec and Aspet mentioned, we face many, many issues and challenges. We need to invent a new narrative with active roles assigned to all parties who are willing to participate and contribute, right? Not everyone in diaspora mm -hmm. will. Our next discussion will be about transforming Armenia diaspora relationships and building a partnership based on mutualism and trust. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you. Thank right. you for the opportunity. Enjoy the conversation, Alec. <laughs> all right, well, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye guys. Bye.